Welcome back to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us today. Do you have ants in your house? We had some in our bathroom. We don't have them anymore because we used the rescue bait trap, uh, ant bait trap. Right. Right. So we actually have ants every spring. And so we always get them like mid April and sure enough they came around so they and what happens is ants seek moisture sources to feed their colonies and food as well and once they establish that food source they relay pheromone trails for other ants to follow and so what happens is that with the ant rescue ant bait stations they will transport the bait back to the colony killing ants at the source so they look for sugars to feed their workers and protein to feed their queen and larva. Rescue ant baits use both protein and sugar for a faster, more complete colony kill. And unlike any other ant baits that leak and spill bait on your floor, rescue ant baits are spill-proof and mess-free. I noticed that they are very well contained um, when we when right. we set ours out. And they're child-resistant and safe to use around the home. Better bait, no mess. Uh, rescue ant baits have it all. You can go to rescue.com. They're made in the USA. Again, that's rescue.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Kelly D. Kelly D. Norris is one of the leading horticulturists of his generation. He is an award-winning author and plantsman and has a new book out called New Naturalism. Naturalism. Welcome to the program, Kelly. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to join not only Holly and us and educate us, but all of our listeners across the country. Now you have a passion for you have a passion for planting more natural plants. We have a lot of listeners who have small spaces and need to grow in pots or containers. Is there a way to grow in containers with more prairie or meadow style plants and have it looking pleasing and not out of place? Oh, I certainly think so. I, you know, I I do a lot of uh, well, I do a fair amount of container gardening myself because I like to experiment with new plants and containers. It gives me a chance to learn about plants up close and you know sometimes I think when we have you know larger wilder spaces sometimes it's like the inverse the container becomes almost the the structural architectural moment so sometimes I grow plants like like yuccas and those sorts of things you know in containers and use them as a sort of counterpoint to other wilder natural kinds of planting but I, I think in short you know you can you can certainly have a lot of fun experimenting and learning about uh, plants in a wilder way inside of containers. Well, a lot of people are buying houses right now and will often get a bunch of perennial plants with that house. I know many people feel bad if they uh, if they want to change things up uh, with the plants or get rid of them and start fresh. Why should people change their landscape and, and uh, do what they want to do so you know, what are some classic perennial plants that someone should consider keeping if they if they are able to purchase a home with them already there? Well, it certainly depends on, you know, what part of the country, you know, you're in. I mean, the whole idea about new naturalism is really thinking about place and about plantings that really resonate with place. So certainly if people are coming into a new home and appreciating or maybe learning or studying what existing plantings they have, you know, certainly take a, a look at Maybe things that are already doing well or things that might be native, that might be a part of the, of the garden already. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's always sort of, I, I think, worth a study of what's already there and use that as a place to, to start from or really just to keep going. Uh, you know, we don't always have to start new gardens or new plantings entirely from scratch. And so I think, you know, uh, th there's... Um, I know when I came to my home garden here, uh, the home I bought about four years ago now, there were certainly some, you know, some attempts at, at gardening at various points in, by previous owners. And, you know, flowering right now is a great flowering quince up along the foundation, which is sort of a, you know, it's kind of a wilder looking plant. It's certainly not native to uh, the U.S., but it's certainly a, a great harbinger of spring and kind of wilder in character. And it fits this sort of overall aesthetic and, and uh, mode of my garden uh, quite well. So I'm, I'm actually you know, quite pleased to, to have it as well, too. And I, there, you know, also happens to be things like Virginia bluebells, which are native, in fact, but are things that the previous owner, you know, sort of adopted into her garden as well. So I, I love, you know, sort of embracing those elements of the past or those remnants of gardens that might become part of a, a new effort under under new management, as it were. Right. And, and you know, like you said, you don't want to necessarily wipe the slate clean because, number one, some of the plants that may be in the landscape of the home you bought are quite pricey and maybe somewhat rare. 
Well, certainly, you know, you, you know, you, you, absolutely, it could be the case. You could certainly end up with uh, with all sorts of things. You know, it's, it's like if you have uh, some nice pieces to work with, it's something that gets you started, and you can always sort of change them later. But you know, when you restart a, a garden entirely, uh, that's it's a fairly disturbing activity from an ecological standpoint, and can certainly invite. Uh, you know, weed pressures and all those other sorts of things. And so oftentimes, you know, I encourage people to to really just assess the garden as they have it and, and to start to think about how their planting choices, if it's a garden, for example, that they have inherited with a house or something uh, that they've bought, uh, you know, it, their planting choices can come to just affect the trajectory of that planting in a new and, and perhaps positive and progressive fashion. Okay, so your new book um, is New Natural Naturalism. Can you tell us something about the book, interesting or notable, and why our listeners would enjoy checking it out? Well, New Naturalism is a conversation between gardeners. I, I am certainly a wild-hearted gardener. I have been fascinated by plants both in wild places as well as by plants in gardens for really the balance of my whole life. And uh, the, the book sort of brings those two strands together in some ways to help encourage gardeners to just think about how we might invite more life into our gardens uh, and how we might ourselves even live in our gardens more. And uh, I think gardeners today are, are keenly aware that our gardens are not separate from the world around us, that in fact that they're a, a little green square in this larger ecological quilt that lays across the landscape and that every planting decision that we make, every new planting space that we, we create or that we, we commence is a stitch in that, in that sort of fabric. And so I think it's a great time in gardening right now because we're, we, we're, we're celebrating sort of the more is more attitude, right? More plants and more insects and more birds and more life and all of those um, the, the, the satisfaction and joys and rewards that we have from that. And so new naturalism is a, a, a one stroke and a sort of practical and encouraging. And, and then another, you know, certainly sort of lays on, you know, ways in which you can approach this that are grounded in science and practice as well, too. So I, I think there's a lot of things in the book for a lot of different kinds of gardeners. That's, that's really great. So we are talking with Kelly D. Norris, one of the leading horticulturists of his generation. He's an award-winning author and plantsman and has a new book out called New Naturalism. So um, talking about your book, you know, there are those gardeners who have a really tidy aesthetic to their landscape and maybe they want to do, introduce some more natural, wild-looking plants, but they just don't quite know how. What are some great tips to perhaps mix that in? Well, certainly grasses, no, no matter where you live in the country, you know, you know we, we all have a native grass palette that can be really valuable. And there are so many grasses, of course, that are celebrated for their ornamental characteristics. And so even just, you know, adopting one or two or three of those where it's appropriate, if, or if you're, you know, have a shady spot, for example, you know, where, where maybe carrots or uh, wood rushes or other native, you know, grass-like plants can thrive, you know, those things can really start to soften some of the other forms of plants that we may grow. And so I talk a lot in the book about combining different architectures of plants and kind of contrasting them and, and you know, starting to sort of marry them together in a way where they play off of each other as opposed to, you know, simply just a collection of plants arranged as lollipops because we like the way they look. Like they, we have to think about, you know, how plants actually grow together and how they change over the course of the seasons because that's what we can learn from a plant community in the wild. I mean, that's sort of what, what the, the sort of those wild and natural places are thinking about. So I, I would encourage people, if, you know, you're starting to think about this. I mean, you can, you can pick a group of plants like grasses or sedges, which I I sort of did by default there, but you can really just, in a bigger way, start to think about how plants relate to each other and how plants grow and change over the course of the season. You know, famously, many of the bulbs that we love in the spring, you know, are really quite ephemeral. They come up now and they do their thing and their foliage kind of goes through a period where maybe it doesn't look quite so nice and then it recedes, you know, into dormancy. And so one of the great things in thinking about the garden is almost like a choreographer is, how do you layer something in so that that retreating foliage doesn't become as much of the focal point of the of what you see as compared to what you know what comes next? And so, sort of thinking about those layers of the garden and how they evolve throughout the gardening season is one way to just sort of you know as you as you look at your garden and start to assess some of that. Definitely. So I know I love visiting botanical gardens, and I definitely think that there's many benefits. 
um, to them. And then, you know, they encourage you oftentimes to become a member. What are the ways that people can get the most out of their botanical garden visit, especially with something that's local and they enjoy going to periodically throughout the year? Oh, that's a great question. I, you know, that one of the, the things I think that we can all do today, or most of us can do with a smartphone in our pocket. I mean, we have incredible cameras right at our fingertips. And, and whether you are a good photographer or not, it doesn't matter. We, you have a visual device to be able to record change. And if you, whether it's in your home garden or your local botanical garden or public park, you know, if you have a chance to really be able to document and, and kind of chronicle the changes in plantings over the course of the season, I think you can be really surprised and you can find a lot to learn from about how plants evolve and change, uh, you know, in the course of a, a season. And it can be, uh, it can be really, really satisfying to sort of learn from, you know, just those small little moments and, and really embrace change, uh, even in, in something as relatively short as a single growing season. So the other thing I would say is if you're visiting a local botanical garden or a public garden, broadly speaking, you know, talk to the staff and the volunteers, ask good questions, ask them about their experiences growing plants, because they're there every day in those garden spaces, cultivating them, making them happen. And so, you know, the more insights that you can collect as a gardener about plants and how they grow and how they interact and respond to the environment, those are, those are huge insights. Well, you have a book, a whole book about bearded irises, a guide to bearded irises. What are some great reasons for our, our listeners and Holly and myself to grow a bearded uh, iris? And what uh, and why should our listeners check that book out? Well, you know, uh, irises are uh, an important part of my my original flora as a gardener, and I think we all have those sort of plants that we uh, we liken to those seminal chapters in our gardening lives. And yes, many years ago, I wrote a book about uh, bearded irises. Uh, I think bearded irises are maybe, as irises go, one of the more accessible and and uh, uh, commonplace and familiar uh, irises. And of course, there's there's, a, there's thousands of different varieties in terms of colors and patterns, and so. Uh, you know, bearded irises are the, the queens of spring in that way. And so, uh, you know, the, the, that book certainly, you know, kind of walks you through all things bearded irises, not only from their history and their colors and their, their patterns and how they kind of evolve, but as well as how to grow them and the different kinds and classes. There's six different classes of bearded irises out there that you can plant and really enjoy flowers from for, you know, really months in the growing season. Fantastic. So um, how can our listeners find out more about you, your great books, all of your great information? Well, you can uh, check out kellydnorris.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. It's a great way to see, you know, just uh, what I'm up to and sharing a few sort of uh, insights and tips along the way. And, and I always love to hear from folks about their questions and their curiosities as it relates to uh, all things plants. Well, Kelly, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered to Holly and myself and all of our listeners and the, and the information you've shared with us. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. And Hey there, gardeners. Thanks for checking out this segment of the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. If you like what you've seen, you can search through the channel and find full in-studio videos of the entire show. If you want to go another route, you can search for it on your favorite podcast platform by searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show or the gardening with joey and holly radio show and you can download it and take it with you you can check out all past seasons at our website the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com under the radio tabs at the top of the page we thank you for joining us we hope you've learned and enjoyed the show the segment and we'll see you next time